Um, so hello everyone from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I am extremely excited to see all of you here. We're gonna give everyone just a few minutes to join. Uh, we are right at 11 o'clock, so we'll start in about 30 seconds, but just wanna make sure that we let everyone uh, join us today. Thank you all for being here. Catherine, we'll just take, give a minute and have more people sign on. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Anna Siefkin. I'm the executive director for the Scott Institute for Energy Innovation in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And we're very excited to have you join us this morning. We have an exceptional guest with us, Kath Catherine Hamilton. We have been working on getting her to have a talk with us for a long time. So we're extremely excited to have her here, particularly during such a huge couple of weeks um, between all of the legislative activity that's happening and COP26 at the same time extremely excited to um, hear her points. So as I mentioned, let me see if I can forward my slides. I'm Anna Siefkin, I'm the executive director. Um, I, these are ways that you can get in touch with me and if we are not connected on LinkedIn, would love to do that. But I also wanna let you know that you can connect with the Scott Institute. So uh, we have a newsletter that comes out once a month. That's how you can hear about these lectures that are coming up in the future. You can follow us on LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, and then we just have a website that is very robust with information about our programming. So the Scott Institute, who are we? So we are the hub for research energy innovation around energy at Carnegie Mellon University. So we do strategic partnerships. We bring together thought leaderships like we have today. And we do a lot with entrepreneurs. We have a master's program that we support as well. So very excited for all of you students that are with us today. And the goal of all of our activities is to drive towards a sustainable lower carbon energy future. So we have a couple of additional lectures that are coming up in the coming weeks, uh, a few lectures, a few webinars um, on November 16th. And I'm gonna go through these actually one by one. I have some slides. I'm gonna jump to the bottom though, because we have a new one. So on either December 15th or 16th, still being decided, we have a, a new lecture webinar panel that's coming together on beneficial electrification and it's uh, gonna feature Alex Lasky from Rewiring America, my typo there, and Kevin Walker from D uh, Duquesne Light Company, he's the CEO. So there's other lectures that I was talking about. Um, Sukshi Talati, um, who is a CMU alum, uh, she will be talking about um, uh, fossil energy in that office, fossil en energy and carbon management, I should say. That's coming up on November 16. Um, our third annual Technology Sustainability Business Forum is coming up. That's a partnership that we have with the Tepper School of Business here at CMU. And that is on November 19th from 1 until 2.30 p.m. Eastern. Um, and then we have a, another session that I have been very excited about, about investing in technologies. We have Breakthrough Energy Ventures, Wireframe Ventures, and the, collaboration, the Collaborative Fund who are coming together on December 2nd. So with that event on December 15th, we will be rounding out our semester programming. So a quick note, particularly for those of you who are students or faculty members, um, we are hosting the Energy Tech University Prize on campus during Energy Week in March of 2022. So that has a, a new competition that's been launched by the DOE's Office of Technology Transitions. And we've been so excited to hear more about this. So basically you can, partner with anyone in a lab as a student and you can be eligible for these prizes. You do need to be a student in either a master's program or an undergraduate program. And so in January, they've announced it, but they're gonna be doing exploratory conversations in January. They're gonna have teams coming together and then pitching uh, that final set of teams is gonna pitch at Energy Week next year. So very excited for the competition. And we also do a lot of work with the American Made Solar Prize. And I want to remind everyone that you all can be a part of this national network of organizations that connect with one another to support startups. So there's information for that at network.americanmadechallenges.org. And with that, I'm going to get to our, our guest speaker for today. So give me a second while I stop sharing here. So Catherine, just give me a minute and I'm going to pull up your bio. So very excited, as I mentioned, that Catherine Hamilton is here. So she is the chair of 38 North Solutions, which is a bipartisan consulting firm that provides business development and public policy services to innovative companies and organizations. So based on their firm's expertise in clean energy and technology, they help clients identify regulatory and legislative 
hurdles, I will call them challenges and opportunities, and then provide uh, creative solutions. She's led several councils uh, at the World Economic Forum and is currently co-chair of the Global Forum, Global Future Council on Clean Electrification. She also served as president of Gridwise Alliance. I've been hearing a lot about Gridwise Alliance. So prior to that role, Catherine was a policy advisor for Good Energies Inc and co-director of the American Bioenergy Association. Every time I read this bio, I'm just more excited about having you here today. So at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, she led buildings research and managed government relations with Washington, DC. She spent a decade at Virginia Power designing overhead and underground electrical systems for commercial and residential developments. She studied electrical engineering at Northern Virginia Community College where uh, uh, Dr. Jill Biden uh, is, a, is a professor. Um, and she holds degrees from Cornell University and the Sorbonne. So she is the longtime host of the Energy Gang podcast, which is where I first got to hear you and know you through that. So I felt like I knew you before we even met. So Catherine, welcome. We're so glad to have you here today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Anna. You all are so impressive. Um, I am, I'm, this is such an honor to be a distinguished lecturer here. And I just want to give everybody a warning that um, my slides will not distinguish themselves. That is not part of my skill set. Um, but I will go ahead and share them so we can go through just a few ideas. Can you see them, Anna? Everybody see them? Okay, great. Thank you. So terrific. So I thought we could kind of talk about uh, where innovation uh, and policy intersect. I realize I'm like a hammer and like everything is policy to me and everything looks like a nail and I'm just gonna hammer it with policy. But there are some things that I think we need to think about that often innovators miss in the course of trying to solve for what they're, what they're doing. So this is sort of the theme of my entire presentation is how do we think about and impact public policy and how can you impact public policy in this clean energy, energy transition? So this is how I think when a, when a company comes to me or a group comes to me and says, this is what we wanna do, I try to figure out where does public policy fit into that? And I think it fits in everywhere. So if you have the big idea first, like a lot of entrepreneurs out there, I've got a widget, it's gonna solve for something, it's gonna be a big idea and everybody's gonna buy it and I'm gonna do great. And I'm gonna make millions of dollars doing it or maybe millions isn't the right denomination anymore. But so first you have to think, what is it gonna solve for? Are there really gnarly problems out there that you're really trying to address? And is it gonna work? So in this whole process, the will it work, we're finding, of course, innovation is much more decentralized and much more democratized. And yet not all solutions to, can just come out of somebody's basement. We need partnerships to make those happen. And those could be through public policy. So those could be through the Department of Energy or one of the national labs. I'm a huge fan because I was at NREL. So I'm a big lab, lab rat, we used to call ourselves. Um, but you know, how will this work? And can public policy help you make that happen? Then the second piece is a business model. I often have entrepreneurs coming to me saying, I have this great idea. It's, and I say, wow, that solves for a huge issue. It looks like it's going to work. But like, how are you going to make money with it? Like, will somebody pay for it? And actually, will a lot of people pay for it? Will it scale? Will you be able to do more with that? And with the business model, again, public policy can have a huge impact on whether you can drive down the cost of it, whether you can scale it, whether it really makes business sense to pursue that innovation. And then the third piece is the market. Like, what does the market look like? Are there customers out there who need this thing and need the solution? And are they willing to are they willing to pay for it? Are they waiting for the solution? And what else is out there? Can it compete? And that's a big question because there are a lot of different solutions for any given use case. And we can talk about any of these that you, you can solve for, for example, grid when you want to harden the grid and make sure that you have that you have backup for renewables we'll say you could use energy storage you could also use hydropower you could also use geothermal any kind of firm resource you could always use you could also use advanced nuclear so there are a lot of different kind of technology solutions for almost any use case that you have and when you have an idea and you want to move your solution forward often policy will make the make or break that difference in how 
the market is created and developed and allows you to participate. So that's how I think of it when an entrepreneur comes to me and says, this is what I need. I'll say, oh, there's so many ways in which policy can impact your business through all of these different sort of aspects of your business. So policy and politics. I always say I hate politics, but the reality is like, you have to have politics to make policy work. So policy is just like, what is the idea that you have? What are the set of ground rules that you wanna, that you wanna have put forward to enable something to happen? And then politics is like, how then does it happen? Like, how does government make that happen? And, you know, I'm not talking about partisan politics necessarily, but really about like, how do you make sure that in any policy that there are winners? And in fact, that everybody thinks that they're gonna win with any specific policy that's put forward. And that's the messaging you have to carry forward is like, this benefits not just you, but the entire public, and this is how. So politics and policy, while different, are both really important to keep in mind. So these are the types of policy venues in which I function and in, you know, in which most policy folks function, which is like your states, so the state executives, the state legislature, so the state executive, the governor will set, will have goals. So for example, in Louisiana, the governor of Louisiana is a Democrat. He has a whole climate change initiative. Now his legislature may not act on that climate change initiative, but what he can do is provide thought leadership. He can do administrative function within the state to try to move that forward. The state legislature is where the laws are made. And often those laws will also govern what the public utility commissions do, which I spent a lot of time with the public utility commissions. Um, and the utilities that they regulate to try to, to try to move policy forward within them, but often that comes down from the state legislature. Then on the federal side, you'll have the federal administration. So the president can do a lot administratively to get things done. Um, but in the end, often it's Congress that will actually have to enact it to make sure that it's, that it's really done in a way that's durable so that it doesn't just fade away or be overturned when the next uh, president comes in. And we're seeing that now, kind of a little bit of a going back and forth based on what the last administration did, a lot of changing back to what President Obama had done. I would say Paris is one of, Paris Accord is one of the big things. And Anna, Anna just got back from, um, from Glasgow, so she could probably talk, speak to that. Um, and then another piece is federal regulatory agencies. And those can affect both you know, state because often they will impact what states do, but regionally can impact a lot of policy and have an enormous impact on markets as well. This is something everybody should watch. It's the Schoolhouse Rock version of I'm Just a Bill on Capitol Hill. Um, it's not bad. It does show what a slog it is. Um, it doesn't necessarily the go, way the go, the, go the way he sings it, but you know, it's a journey. And when I say, people say it's the journey, not, uh, not the end result. It actually is the end result that matters. The journey can be extremely painful. And I would say it's a little bit like crawling across, across broken glass at the moment, but we're getting there. So what kinds of policies help clean energy as an entrepreneur? Tax credits, oh my gosh, everybody loves tax credits. Everybody understands tax credits. Those are great. And those are things that have been around for a long time. People can get their heads around them because they've been out there. Grant programs, free money. Nobody wants to not have free money. That's great. Loan programs is not free money, but still it gives you some time. Often you can get a good deal from the government if you go through something like the loan programs office. So that's another way that policy can help clean energy. Regulation, please do not fall asleep. This is super important. Um, environmental regulation. So greenhouse gas, methane emissions rules, vehicle standards, all of those things that are regulation are really important to driving the market and sending a signal to technology developers. Performance, and those are things like clean energy goals, um, equipment and appliance standards, building codes. Those are all performance goals and standards that really also drive markets for companies. And then really specific market-based regulation like what comes out of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which will be setting up the rules by which different technology use cases and different characteristics and applications can actually be compensated for what they provide to the public. Um, so those are all very market-based incentives. And then finally, financial incentives. And there are a lot of ways financial incentives can manifest, including you know, disclosure. And that's, that's a big thing right now is trying to figure out like how do we actually disclose the carbon emissions that all of our industry sectors produce? Um, and that can be very powerful in driving the market and shedding a light on what's happening. 
So impacting policies is what I spend all my time doing. And, and to be clear, as Anna had said, I started in technology doing grid stuff, but I had always been super interested in communications and how do you tell the story of technology? And then through that, how do you impact policy? So you have a narrative, like what's my story? What is the problem I'm trying to solve? And does does my solution not just solve for one thing, but does it solve for a multitude of things? And that's really important right now because the administration is trying to solve for a lot of different problems. And so, you know, how, do, how does what I do solve for these bigger problems? And then how can I go from the pilot, you know, we've probably heard of death by pilot, which is like, oh, I'm gonna do a pilot project here. I'm gonna do a pilot project here. I'm gonna do a pilot project here. But how do you take those pilots and actually scale them and make it so that it's like business as usual? Um, and then how do you build credibility as an entrepreneur? What do you do that shows to others that what you're trying to get done and what you have thought up as your big idea or your initiative is credible um, because you want to become a trusted resource to policymakers so that policymakers understand that you should be listened to, that your ideas should be considered. Um, and through that, you can create an echo chamber. And that's often through building relationships and allies. So finding other like-minded folks. And this happens all the time with industry groups. For example, you know, like the Solar Industry Association, the Energy Storage Association, all of these different groups. And often they're not specific trade associations or very formalized trade associations, but just groups of like-minded uh, companies, individuals, um, also NGOs that have similar goals that are going to kind of come together to try to get something done. And through building those relationships, it really allows all boats to rise. And um, that's another way to get policy done because if policy can only help one company, it very likely won't happen. So here's the, here's the, here's what y'all need to know <laughs> about the, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. It just passed in the house on Friday night, it's also known as Biff, which sounds like a guy I went to high school with. Um, and this bill will then be signed into law by the president. And this is an infrastructure bill. This is really about coming together in a bipartisan way to do infrastructure. It's like roads and bridges. It has a bunch on grid modernization and resilience. There's transit, rail, school buses, electrifying school buses. Electric, char electric vehicle charging infrastructure throughout on um, federal highways, um, rural broadband. So rural broadband is crucial to clean energy technology getting out the door because if you can't monitor over the internet what's happening with customers, it's really hard to get these technologies out to folks um, out in rural communities and in more disadvantaged communities that may or may not have good broadband. And then there's a lot on critical materials too, because critical materials, of course, go into everything. And if we can create a circular economy and put all these back into the economy, then that continues um, economic growth and development. So those are just a few of the things in this infrastructure bill. It's a big deal. It's not the climate bill. It does have some impact on climate and it will be helpful to enabling climate solutions, but this is not the climate bill. And I'll talk about what that is. The climate bill is called the Build Back Better Act, and that's reconciliation bill. And what that is, is not a bipartisan bill. This is Democrats only bill that is being negotiated right now in the House and the Senate, and there are a lot of parameters around it. Everything in it has to impact the budget. So it either has to be taxing or spending. So you'll see in this bill, a bunch of clean energy tax credits. That's great. Those are tax credits. Tax impacts the budget. Those are absolutely appropriate for a bill like this. Um, electric vehicle tax credits are in here too. So clean energy includes all the renewables folks, but also includes like new sorts of technologies like microgrids and energy storage, hydrogen. There are a bunch of different technologies that have now been included, uh, which we think will be really good to spur innovation. They're gonna be home efficiency, electrification rebates, um, domestic supply chains and manufacturing, a lot of incentives for those. So this is spending money. There's also something called the Clean Energy Accelerator, which is essentially a national green bank, which would be outside of government. It would be a nonprofit stood up that funding would th flow through EPA to an entity that would 
would then be able to do things that the government can't do. So the government can only do basically debt or grants. And this would be able to blend finance. It would take on different debt positions. It would be able to do take on uh, like um, lower debt positions. It would be able to blend finance. It could do a lot warehouse um, projects. So the accelerator is one of the biggest pieces of reconciliation at this point. And that's something that's really interesting and different. Um, that we think will help states uh, achieve their goals too. So these are all of these sort of provisions and there are a bunch, there are a bunch more provisions in this. There was one thing that was the, the kind of the clean energy standard that a lot of folks have been talking about, which would be, which then became the clean electrification payment plan, which basically would provide incentives to utilities or generators to switch over to clean generation. That fell out um, that does not mean this is not a huge climate bill. This is this will still be the most ever spent on climate in the history of this country. And so I think it's still a hugely important bill. There's some little thing I put at the bottom called the bird rule because um, people talk about it and then it, it's very arcane. It's named after a senator who is buried not far from where I live, from who was, who was a West Virginia senator, um, Senator Bird, And basically... What this does is it says there's certain, <coughs> excuse me, there's certain rules around what you can do in this bill. And there are a lot of things that could be, that could fall out because they're policy oriented rather than spending. So it has to be spending. So, you know, often you'll read something and it's like you're reading a tweet because it's so short and it doesn't really describe what the intent of the legislation was. And the reason for that is because can't be written as public policy. And so you have to write, it's not a great way to write policy at all. So you're trying to get a lot done by putting money into something, but often it has to be directed at an existing program or be written in such a way that it is so specifically targeted at a budget or tax impact, you can't really say much around it. So everything has to go through what's called the Senate parliamentarian and she kind of decides yes or no. And it's been vetted all along for the last few months. They've been running things by her to say like, do you think this would make it through? Would this make it through? But basically if something does not withstand a challenge based on the bird rule, as it goes through the Senate, the entire provision could be thrown out. Um, so they've been really careful about trying to make sure that that any of these provisions that are in reconciliation will make it through. Right now where reconciliation stands is the House um, has the bill posted on the Rules Committee website. So that's the, the House bill. They're gonna wait for the Senate to act. The House is waiting to get a score from the Congressional Budget Office. And it usually takes a few days, a couple of weeks. <laughs> so there's a chance, they're, they're out this week, there's a chance next week that the House could get the score um, which a lot of the moderate Democrats want to see how much this is going to cost and is and is it's paid for in large part by taxes for the ultra wealthy and the top corporations that currently don't pay taxes so there there are things that are helping to pay for this investment. Um, and so if that score turns out okay for them for the the moderates, um, then the House can take it to the floor so there's there's a chance that could could be done by Thanksgiving. At this, then it'll be sent to the Senate. So the Senate will take that bill. They're already thinking about some changes they want to make. And the Senate, since it's 50-50 and they have to, you know, everybody in the Senate has to approve of this. Every single Democrat and the vice president will have to vote for it too. Um, they have to get the approval of every single member um, of the Democratic Party in the Senate. So with that in mind, um, It'll go to the Senate and they will then figure out, does everybody agree to this? I think a lot of what's happened has been agreed to. Um, and again, West Virginia figures strongly in this as, as you all may have heard, uh, Senator Manchin has a, lot, has, a, has a lot of input. In fact, any one Senator could have a lot of input into what's happening in this bill. Um, but he's the chair of Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. So he sort of has a leadership role as well. Um, but a lot of this has been pre-vetted by him. So there are things around the edges, but the Senate could act after Thanksgiving before the, the uh, winter holidays. And you know, if they do that, and it's one word different from what the pa has, House passed, which is very likely it will be one word different, um, it'll go back to the House for a final vote before it goes to the president's desk. So that's kind of where we are now. It's 
pretty gnarly situation, but also um, the staff are incredible. They've been working night and day for months and months to get this thing over the finish line and to make sure that, as I had said before, everybody needs to win, that everybody can win. And in fact, even the people, the Republicans that aren't going to vote for this, their states and their districts are going to win as well. Um, because a lot of this funding, a lot of these initiatives will absolutely help them. And certainly the infrastructure bill too will help them, but this will also help them. And there are lots of programs specifically directed at a number of states that aren't blue states, but are states everywhere in the U.S. Now, <laughs> this is what everybody wants to know. How do I get me some of that? Um, because there will be a lot of money that heads to the agencies, especially Department of Energy. And I feel like they're like running around, try, they're gonna be running around trying to catch all this. Everybody else is gonna be running around trying to catch all this. So part of this is like, as an innovator, how do you think about how can I support my project um, or my initiative or my technology through all of this funding out there? Part of it is like defining what you're doing. Like, what are you actually doing? And can you put it into words that people can understand? Who are your partners? It's gonna be really important in some of this to identify utility partners and other partners that could be really helpful. Maybe a national laboratory would be a partner too in something like this. Um, and then you also wanna solve for, for a lot of goals and a lot of problems. So while in Congress, you're solving for a lot of state and local constituencies, once you get to the Department of Energy, you need to solve for what their goals are. And the president has a lot of goals that are very intertwined, economic development and growth, increasing jobs. And a lot of those jobs are gonna have to be, you know, with, with strong labor provisions, whether they're union jobs or otherwise comply with Davis-Bacon. So there are a lot of job um, strictures are going to be put on these projects, solving for climate, what is the greenhouse gas emission reduction impact on anything you do, and then also making sure everything is equitable. So in all of these provisions that are going through reconciliation, there's an equity component. For example, in the accelerator, the National Green Bank, 40% of all of that money is dedicated to equity, and that's in disadvantaged communities, that's in rural communities, that's, that's trying to help those communities that are either adversely more impacted by climate than others or are having a really hard time in the transition and are not able to make it. Um, they're not able to afford rooftop solar. They're not able, they don't have broadband so you can take advantage of that. So equity is really built into everything and being able to position as solving for those big goals. And then there are a bunch of other goals like cybersecurity or resilience. So there are other, there are other problems out there that need to be solved for, but solving for those big ones is gonna be really important. And then building support for whatever you do. You know, going in on your own is really difficult. Like having either, you know, other company partners, or if you have, you know, the support of your congressperson or senators, that's really helpful because it shows that you have, that, that you're bigger than just what you want to do, that, that you're going to be solving for other people and that it will be for the public good. So that is the end of my specific comments. I know that Anna, you have some questions for me and I, Hope I didn't. I feel like I was filibustering, but please. No, no. I these are uh, these are fantastic comments, and it's interesting because even those of us who work in this all the time don't know how the sausage is made. So I really appreciate a lot of the details. In fact, I texted our like some people and said, "Are you on this? Because you really should be. And if not, I'm going to send you the video." <laughs> um, so I have a couple of questions. So we have questions that have come in. Um, there's some questions that are coming in live, which I'll, I'll pull up. Don't worry about that. But if anyone else has a question for Catherine, um, you can use the Q and a, um, we're not using the chat for this. It's easier for us to track it in the Q and a. So put a question in there and I'm going to put a question out right now that has come in from the national renewable energy laboratory. <laughs> uh, your friend, my friend, uh, yes. Ellen has Hi, asked Ellen. <laughs> Um, she says, how do you make the provisions in the recently passed infrastructure bill and build back better uh, resonate with the average voter in the 2024 election? That's a great question because most of our folks on the line here are policymakers, advocates, they work at commercial, you know, uh, like companies or their students. So how do they help? Like, so it's a two, I'm going to add the second part of the question, which is like how, what, what messaging works and how do we get at it? 
Yeah, that is a super question. And that's like why wonks like me shouldn't be out there <laughs> talking to normal human beings because we'll get into like, well, you know, the FARC noper will do this. Like nobody understands that. But people do understand like your internet stinks or you don't have it. This is going to give you internet. Or like you can't afford solar. You're going to be able to afford solar and you're going to be able to get directly paid to do it. It's not, you're not going to have to get tax, you're not going to have to go through some special tax provision, or you'll be able to have a whole bunch of your heat pump paid for. If you flip over to, you know, if your heat pump dies, which mine recently did, you can then convert um, to electric from gas and this will pay for it. So you can talk about what the immediate impact is like roads and bridges, infrastructure, like everybody has to drive on a road or across a bridge everybody has electricity in this country so like don't you want it to be better so i feel like there is a really strong message and i think this is there's just to be clear the infrastructure bill while it is very important and while the president is going around talking about it his entire agenda is based on not just that but also the build back better and build back better is the reconciliation bill which is like while we're doing it, can we make it better than it was before so we don't have to just keep doing the same thing and we're not continuing to harm our children's lungs like, and you know, make, make our planet even more fragile and make our crops die? So I think there, there's definitely a way to talk about climate that really reaches in and creates a storyline for people everywhere, whether they're in a rural setting or an urban setting everybody basically wants the same thing and things in life. And if we can distill it to like how this can be positively impacting those things, I think we're, we're a long way there. Um, so this is a question that's interesting because it's one of our guests, I think who's asked it in every single question or every single session we've had recently, but I think it's a good one, which is what are the wicked problems that are impeding the just transition to clean and circular economy for middle America? Yeah, I mean, I feel like from where I sit, the wickedest problem is trying to trying to, to give everybody ownership of this problem and not have it be so bifurcated and polarized by political party. Like everybody stands to benefit from a lot of what the trans from everything that the transition does, and you have to figure out like what does that actually mean for people. And so I feel like a lot of it is telling that story and getting to people on the ground and like taking the, like neutralizing the, pol the political polarization from it and just talking about what impacts them on a daily basis. And not talking about, like, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I'm part of my family's from Appalachia. I spent a lot of time out in rural America, uh, Western Virginia, not West Virginia. And um, our land, there was a guy who does some like landscaping stuff, was like driving his truck around. And I said, do you know that there is like an F-150 electric truck? And he was like, no way, why do I care? And I was like, because when your power goes out, you could power your house with it. And he was like, sweet, I wanna get that. Like having it be like something that really touches someone's life where it's not like something super special and bespoke and only for rich people, like that's gonna be really, really important to connect those dots. Right. So uh, the question actually had come in from Chris Gassman, who's at the University of Pittsburgh Center for Sustainable Business. So he's just reminding me that that was his question. So thank you, Chris. Um, I'm gonna switch back to public policy. Um, so when you're crafting climate policy, um, is it just as important to consider the possibility of the policy being approved and therefore make the policy more palatable for lawmakers it is to as it is to focus on the science and we, what needs to be done to prevent the worst impacts of climate change. Now there's a hard one for you. Oh gosh. First of all, I have seen policy that defies the laws of physics and that is not what you want. Like it was like good intention, but I was like, that actually won't work physically. That's not the way electricity actually works. So you don't wanna like be against science. You actually want to use science as the basis for whatever you do. And by science, I'm like broadly speaking of, you know, whether it's chemistry or physics or, you know, any kind of engineering, you definitely don't want to go against that. Um, at the same time, you have to figure out how do I get the most done without completely um, watering it down so that nothing gets done. And, you know, we, we sort of face this with, the, with this clean electricity standard that we were really hopeful because 
that sets a market signal, like having, you know, having the whole country. And this is what um, President Obama did when he did, you know, the the clean power plan was he said, all right, here's what everybody's going to have to do. So if you don't do it through legislation, you can do it through regulation. And trust me, EPA is going to do something that is not as that's not as stakeholder friendly as doing it legislatively, where everybody, all the stakeholders are part of the process. So, you know, I was disappointed that that fell out at the same time. I think there are going to be some other proposals that are going to be raised up that will still send the market signals. I mean, tax credits send the market signals. A lot of these programs will send the market signals as well. Um, and, you know, part of this is like, how do you get something over the finish line? And this is the politics part of it, like making sure everybody succeeds. And trust me, all of those people who are voting against this, they're all going to get something out of it. And they'll probably tout it when they go to get reelected. All right. So the questions are really coming in. So thank you, everyone. I'm going to, I'm going to get to a couple of these. Um, so uh, Matthew Mahoney, who has been with doing energy related things in our region for a long time, asks, so the Build Back Better Act negotiations have received a lot of negative coverage. So what are some th good things that came out of the negotiations? And what have we learned about how policies are negotiated in today's political arena? So um, the key word in that question is coverage, and that's media coverage. And I will just put this out there. The media has been pretty bad in all of this because the media loves, they've gotten used to a lot of drama. I think the last four years, there was just so much drama. It was hard for them to even process. And there was a little bit of like lack of drama for a while. And so there was a lot of drama about, oh, everybody's fighting. The progressives are fighting the moderates. It's like, that's actually what negotiation looks like is people trying to figure out what they want to get out of something. And this whole line that progressives are going to bring it down, like what the progressives want is, is to support the president's agenda. What is in the Build Back Better Act is the president's agenda. If you look at what the president ran on and what the, what's all over the White House website and like, here are all my fact sheets, that's what that is. And so this is just about actually having a negotiation. And that is a healthy thing. That's what should happen. Now, what you don't want to have happen is for it to just like completely collapse. I, I will promise you something will happen. <laughs> it, will, it will not collapse. It has to happen because all those people that are negotiating are in the same political party and they know if something doesn't happen, they will not get reelected. They may not get reelected anyway. But just keep in mind, like I always tell my clients, don't read don't read the media stories because it will just upset you and you'll have a paper bag you're breathing into all the time. And I think like understanding that the media is trying to gin up controversy when often a negotiation may look tense, but that actually means they're moving forward and they have been moving forward all along. Another question, um, and this, this has come in from, I believe a student at Carnegie Mellon, but I'm not sure. It could be a faculty member, so apologies because I can't read the email address. Uh, can you provide insight into why the Build Back Better provisions were chosen? For example, why selection of school buses? Was there a carbon counting component or a cost benefit analysis? Like, I mean, because we all hear that there are lobbying interests. Was it yep. lobbying or was it based on the science and the calculations? Yeah, so it's kind of a combination. I mean, certainly there are interest groups like the solar industry, like they want to continue the tax credits. They want to make sure that low income community, I worked on a lot of the equity provisions. So a lot of the low income provisions are extended and there's extra, there's extra credit for solar in low income communities, bonus credits for community solar, things like that. So there are definitely interest groups that um, my equity coalition had like civil rights groups and viros and businesses. So sometimes when those come together, that's really helpful on just being able to identify and define something that's that's helpful for public policy writ large. And it helps a lot of people. Certainly there are very specific interests like school electric school buses. There are all these school buses. First of all, kids have to breathe that stuff. Did anybody ride a school bus when they were a kid? It is awful, they are stinky. So like getting off of diesel and moving to electric is really good. So that's a, that's a good thing to do. But yes, on the question of carbon, absolutely. There has been all along and trying to identify how, what is the emissions reduction potential in every single one of these things. It's really tricky because they do it in different ways. Um, sometimes it's avoided. Some, you know, it's just, you know, there are a lot of different ways to calculate it. And sometimes those calculations, they're all over the map, but there has definitely be a, been a concerted effort to try to follow the science and say, all right, so what can we get? What's the biggest bang for our buck? What are the things that really impact emissions the most? And how do we get 
get the most out of those. So yes, I would say, yes, there are interests certainly, but there are also people in Congress staffers that are tracking absolutely in real time what this would do on emissions and how do they, how do they count that and, and calculate it and make sure that it adheres to that doesn't increase emissions. Great. All right, David Fisher has asked, uh, with the infrastructure bill in mind and the reduced cost of solar um, energy products over the last uh, solar solar energy products over the last decade, is solar energy going to finally really grow this spring? Um, I guess he's asking about solar farms, agrivoltaics, residential rebates, et cetera. So do you really think it's going to explode like it might? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think a lot of folks are holding off right now just to wait and see what happens with reconciliation because it's going to be, I mean, these, these tax credits, um, when they're done, I mean, they start in 2022. So it's very, very right around the corner. So yes, I absolutely think that is true. There's a little bit of, um, I didn't talk that much about it, but there's supply chain issues, certainly. There are also some trade policy issues that are providing um, some challenges. So there's a great emphasis um, in this bill and actually in the infrastructure bill too on domestic manufacturing. And that takes time to pull together, but I think the trajectory is gonna be really positive. Okay. So a, a similar question on energy storage, because we know with solar, we also need solar storage. So what policy and market mechanisms are gonna be required to enable long duration energy storage? Yeah, so I mean, the tax credits certainly are gonna be there for long duration. There's also in the infrastructure bill, a big piece um, on storage. And there's this um, storage shot, like kind of like the sun shot was at Department of Energy, they're doing storage and there's long duration is a big, huge piece of it's long duration energy storage shot. I mean, that is gonna be a huge focal point of Department of Energy. So, you know, they can help on those pilots that can then, lead to scale. And there are a lot of companies out there doing this and trying different things. I work with two companies that do long duration. I'm a big storage fan. People don't know I'm a homer on that. So I'm probably, <laughs> it's probably unfair, but I mean, the original storage goals in California really started this all off and a lot of states have those goals, but storage now can solve for a lot of issues. And we've certainly brought down the cost and perfected some of the short-term, you know, short duration issues, but long durations is gonna be really important with the increase in renewables and making sure that we have firm backup um, to, to actually allow those renewables to become more like baseload. So I think that is really on a good path. Um, uh, I'm gonna ask a question about hydrogen. So if you've done your homework on those topics, what about hydrogen? So what are the biggest challenges that you see technology policy investment and then the colors, right? So how many colors do we have? <laughs> There's so Blue, many colors. Green, pink, purple. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So anybody who's heard me on the energy gang knows I'm like a green one. That's kind of the only color that I'm thinking about here. Not all the other ones that are, have other issues. Um, I think certainly on green hydrogen, especially the department of energy also has a hydrogen shot. So they're doing a hydrogen challenge too. They want to make sure that they fund it. Um, I mean, I think there are a lot of issues around hydrogen that there are a few things that will mitigate for that. One is like the Department of Energy initiative and programs and, and partnerships with labs to kind of help solve for some of the things that are a little bit gnarlier. The other thing is like, it's, it's a lot, there's a lot involved in the process. It's just, there are a lot of steps to get to hydrogen in the process. And so I've always thought it's like, it, it's gonna be tricky just from an efficiency standpoint and losses standpoint to, and that's gonna be something they're gonna to have to work on. There's like a, a right now in the, um, in the bill, the big Build Back Better bill, there is a huge hydrogen credit of $3 a kilogram, which will really help the hydrogen industry. And, you know, there are just so many different use cases for it. Um, and so hopefully the industry will go to where we really have hard decarbonization issues, whether that's industrial applications. Um, you know, I feel like on like, light duty vehicles, that's like not gonna be the winning tool, it, but on industry and some of these some of these sectors that have been really hard to decarbonize, I think there's like absolutely a super strong pathway. So um, 
going on, I'm gonna sort of riff off of what you just talked about with like green only. So um, having just come back from COP, which I was um, you know, honored to be able to go for um, a week, there was a lot of discussion by not only like student groups, student protest groups um, saying that we should basically just turn off fossil immediately and go directly to the new technologies. And if we don't, we're not going to get where we need to go, which is to stay below 1.5 C. So how do you, you know, have, where have you seen the question? This is where the question comes in, which is where have you seen storytelling about financing the, the transition with voter interest and behaviors and the interests of coal, natural gas, and the lobby. So that's like a quite a few things. Oh my also, gosh! But, but it's it's so we have this. We have you know a, a huge contingent of people who just says say let's just go totally green, and then we have a bunch of other people who are saying it can't quite happen that way. So how do we marry those two together in a way that makes an energy transition possible in time? Yeah. Um, often the people who say it can't quite go that way are the fossil fuel interests. So there is, there's a pretty strong interest in, for example, the natural gas industry to try to keep themselves going and maybe adjust somewhere along the way. I mean, there's, there's a, there's a big initiative certainly with the oil and gas industry to try to reduce methane, which is huge. So yay, we need to do that right away. Um, but you know, my thought is if you just let people go and the incumbency just digs deeper and entrenches more. So trying to find a pathway to like, all right, how do you do this? Like, what's really like, should, could you not do any more development? Can you not do any more exploration? Are there things that you can stop now that are realistic? And I think the, the financial community, the bankers are going to decide that in a lot of ways, just they're not going to finance a lot of this stuff. Um, but you know, my sense is like, we have a huge problem um, in this planet and we're going to have to leapfrog. And, you know, maybe there's some way we can find the, you know, use, re repurpose some of the skill sets in these industries to help us leapfrog. But I think entrenching and saying, oh, well, we can just use this product and just like suck emissions out of the air forever. It's like, I don't, I don't know that that's actually going to do anything. Like I, I'm much more skeptical about that than trying to figure out how do we leapfrog and really get out of this. So um, I'm, I'm glad that there's some pressure being put on this, the question of like, how do we, how do we really transition? And honestly, power production is the least of our issues on that. It's really going to be on the chemical side and then the industrial heating side that we're going to have, we're going to have to rethink things. And um, luckily there's so many entrepreneurs out there with great ideas that I think could help us all. So I'm going to, another question that's based on that. Um, so there are some people who say that we have all the technology that we need um, and that everything's already, you know, we have enough and others who say technology is the only pathway. So where do you stand on that sort of path between things that already exist? Do we have, if we just did focus on the building sector, commercial, industrial, uh, you know, or a hydrogen technology, for example, that would be on the new. So where do you sort of fall on that trajectory? Both, we have to do it all. We gotta like start doing stuff now. We gotta get electrification. We gotta do everything we can. We gotta throw everything at it. So that means doing everything we have already and continuing to explore technologies that are new so that you know, five, 10 years from now we'll have other solutions or we'll drive down the cost of some of those existing ones. So I, mean, I think we have to do everything. We have to throw everything at this. And I think we shouldn't let perfect be the enemy of the good. We need to start getting stuff out the door now and you know and and make it cost effective for people and make sure we, we're telling the the story in a way and giving people in the right incentives to move forward and luckily like public you know the public perception is very much positive on this like the public really believes that this is a problem and we have to solve it and and i think people often ask themselves well what do i do which also takes the <laughs> takes the onus away from the people who are often the worst offenders but I mean, everybody has a role to play in this. And I honestly think we have to do everything. I don't think we can wait at all, but I think we also have to think about like, what are the technologies that are going to come down the pipe? Right. I, I realized that I asked you a question that of course the answer has to be all of the above. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so so um, a question that goes back to just a couple of questions. There's some questions that are still coming in. Thank you everyone for the questions. Um, so how can the interaction the interaction with the grid energy markets help with the development of clean energy? So that goes back to your grid alliance background in addition to your current work. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly, and I, I do a lot of work. I run a group called the Advanced Energy Management Alliance, and that's all we do is work on like, how do we allow everybody to participate in energy markets, even those on the customer side of the grid? So not just the supply side, not just the large renewables, large production facilities, but also like, how do you allow, you know, aggregated solar or distributed energy resources of all types um, that are behind the meter, storage, um, you know, energy efficiency, how do we allow all of that to participate in the market and be part and be considered a resource, a fair resource. And um, so FERC, I spent a lot of time at FERC, everybody knows that. Um, Order 2222 was something that this association, AEMA, um, and Gridwise Alliance was a long time ago. That was most about, mostly about the stimulus. I mean, they're still out there doing a lot of that stuff, but on the FERC front, it's really been um, trying to make sure first that demand response was upheld, which we did, a, you know, we fought in the Supreme Court for that, which went really well. And then now trying to make sure that like everybody's able to, to participate in the market. Um, and, and what's gonna be really interesting to watch is the FERC leadership and how much carbon is valued. So a lot of it has been based on resilience, reliability, cost, you know, the cost to the customer. Um, but carbon is gonna be really interesting to see how that impacts that, all, the entire market construct. But I think that's something we can watch for. Okay. So I have two more questions before I want your parting thoughts. So um, like, again, thank you so much for all of the questions that have come in. They're coming in live there. We have a couple that came in beforehand. So. Um, a question that's come in is leaving aside the real possibilities that measures like all of these that we've talked about could get passed. Could a carbon tax be included in the reconciliation bill because it means taxing, uh, but not a national cap and trade system because it is some sort of regulation. So trying to understand that bird rule, they say. Yeah, there, yeah, that's a, that's a good observation too. So that has gotten some airtime recently. There was uh, something in Bloomberg um, that Senator Whitehouse from Rhode Island said that he thought that he had support for, he had 49 senators supporting a carbon tax of $20. It's not a very high carbon tax, um, but that would be one way to pay for some stuff that you would do. Um, uh, he does not, I believe, have Senator Manchin. So that would be the <laughs> actual test of whether you could get that done. Um, a lot of folks have been thinking about this for a long time, certainly um, Chairman Wyden, who chairs the Senate Finance Committee, the Tax Writing Committee in the Senate, is very supportive of that. I mean, he's very supportive of greenhouse gas emission targets, and in fact, his whole tax provision is written with that as the underlying principle. I don't even know that that will meet the bird rule. We'll have to see. Um, but for the carbon tax, yeah, there's a I think people are kind of searching for what can we do if we don't have this clean energy standard. So like, could it be this? Um, and it really is gonna hinge on Senator Manchin and what he thinks. Um, our neighbor next door in West Virginia. Um, last question and then again, we'll, we'll have your final thoughts. Um, electricity consumers, especially residential and small business have, have little sort of, I guess, standing in energy policy and regulation. I guess the question is meaning say so, maybe the, they're not as heard. So can community solar build a large uh, constituency for small energy users? Would that be a pathway or do you have other ideas for residential? Because most of what we've been talking about has been, um, well, it hasn't exactly been residential, but can you talk about that? Yeah, totally. And yes, community solar certainly can. That's a great tool. There's a there's a group called Local Solar for All that has done a ton of work on that, on messaging and modeling. You know, part of the issue is like when you go into a state proceeding, none of the customers, you know, the customers are seen of as like a demand. Like they just want from us. They just suck and suck and suck electrons. They don't have any value to the grid. And we need to flip that and say, wait a second, they can potentially be an enormous resource. So let's think of them as a resource instead. And so having groups like, you know, like Coalition for Community Solar Access, Local Solar for All, all these folks and my group, Advanced Energy Management Alliance, we try to turn that around and say, wait a second, like modeling shows that this is a real resource and you should count it as you think about doing your long-term plan, resource plans for, for any kind of state, any, any utility, you should think about that differently. So I think that is something to do, but there are also certainly solar developers, like I would say Sunrun, companies like that, that are spending a lot of time out there lobbying and trying to impact mm -hmm. through SIA and other organizations to try to impact and make sure that 
like rooftop solar gets direct pay and that kind of, you know, those kinds of incentives. Um, there's going to be a big um, pot of funding. I think it's $7 billion that'll go through EPA basically for rooftop solar for low income communities. Um, and, and of course, the trick here and what's like underlying this question is connecting the dots of like, how does this program actually get to the people that need it? And so we're going to need a lot of help on that. Um, but I think, you know, this is proved true in Arizona. Like once you give people something, do not take it away. Like you cannot take solar away from those people now. And so you know, then you can actually activate people when, when, when you give them something or allow them to have access to something and then say, oh no, we're going to, we're going to now take that away from you, or we're going to tax you in some way for having that. People are not happy with that, and you can get. Oh, are you still there? Yep. Okay. Um, so then, tell tell us kind of our big final thoughts. So, if we had, if you had just a couple of ideas that you wanted to convey about um, how we should be thinking about all of this, sort of, what would it be? Yeah, so I mean, first, it's not just y'all, but all y'all can have an impact. Um, it's really like everybody can participate. And I think everybody should try in some way to participate. And like, if you care about this, you can have a say and you can meet with your members of Congress, even your, your state delegates, your state senators to talk about like why you care, why this is important. Um, you know, why a transition is good for the economy of wherever you are, why if you don't transition, someone else will, and you're going to lose out. So I would say everybody can have an impact and everybody should have an impact. The other big thing is like the whole, you know, Congress and all the noise around it and everybody screaming and yelling, <laughs> it's a lot of noise and it's hard to filter that and say, well, is anything actually going to get done? And you know, so finally we got the infrastructure bill and something will get done this year on climate. I have all the faith in the world that it will. And I think just letting folks know, letting your elected officials know that it is really important that this is something that you deeply care about um, is gonna help get that over the finish line. And no matter what party they're in, because I think it's even though the Republicans are not gonna vote for this bill, it is still important that they hear from you and that they hear that this is important because everybody stands to benefit and everybody stands to be hurt if we don't do something. Okay. So with that, um, thank you so much, Catherine Hamilton for being with us today. As I, uh, you did not disappoint. I am so excited for the information that I learned. I was taking a lot of notes because again, I, I don't live in this exact space where I know the ins and outs, um, but just so excited to hear that from you. So with that, I wanna thank our audience for joining us today, uh, for being a part of this conversation. Catherine, thank you again. Um, and looking forward to seeing all of you online and in person, more and more in person um, in the coming weeks and months. So Catherine, thank you again. And we'll thank you see. so much. We got great wonky questions and I love that. So thank you. <laughs> That's right, we did get some wonky questions. Thank you all. Thanks very much, Catherine. Bye-bye.